Hello, baseball fans. Giants fans. Evolutionary science fans. Yeah. All right. I know that's why you're really here tonight. You're here to learn about evolution. All right, so today I'd like to talk to you about shoulders and, and other things. I really want to talk to you about how human throwing uh, is really based off of uh, a whole suite of traits um, that are both derived in humans as well as based off of our ape heritage. And to sort of get it started, though, I'd like to talk to you about this guy right here. It's a little bit of a sad story. His name is Santino. Uh, he's, a, he's a famous ape. Uh, he's not internet famous. He's... He's just kind of famous. Uh, Santino has this uh, particular problem. He really enjoys throwing things at people who come to him at the zoo. This is in Sweden. And so this would be you know, somewhat comical, if not for the fact uh, that it's actually a little bit sad because his real desire to really stick it to the man, right, and throw things at people who come visit him and watch him at the zoo is really uh, a little bit problematic because he really sucks at it. He's not very good at it. Um, Santino really can't throw that well. Um, he is 165 pounds. That's a big animal. Um, and 30 years old, and he can only throw about one-third the speed of little Jimmy here, right? So your average little leaguer, 12 years old, can throw about 60 miles an hour. Now, you might remember this uh, little lady from the news, Moday Davis, uh, 11 years old. She can throw at 70 miles an hour. That's pretty remarkable. Now, what's remarkable about this, when you think about it, is aren't chimps supposed to be really strong? And how strong really are they? Well, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> um, because I just happen to have some information here. So it's actually really hard to study anything about chimpanzees, especially when they become adults, because as you can imagine, if you were, I don't know, abducted by aliens and thrown into some sort of intergalactic space zoo and asked to do different things, you would probably be pretty pissed off about it and not actually do them. And so the added thing about chimps is that they're very strong, as it turns out, but getting them to do something where you test their strength is not something where uh, they, they, they're likely to do it. Now, uh, in 1926, a man by the name of Bauman actually tried to measure something about the strength of chimpanzees. And so the great thing about reading some of these old papers is very narrative in the way that they write these things. So he says that Suzette, evidently fancying that she had the handlers of the apparatus at a disadvantage and could pull it to place pieces, sprang at the rope. This is a dynamo dynamometer. It's a very hard word to say. Sprang at the rope and bracing both feet against the bars, pulled back with both hands upon the rope, making a pull on the letter that recorded, now we should have had this question for our earlier quiz, how many pounds do you think that she could pull, grabbing this apparatus, both hands, pulling as hard as she could? Any, any thoughts out there? How much? Wow, that's a lot. <laughs> 600, that's good too. Here, I'll just tell you, it's 1,260 pounds. All right, so that's pretty remarkable. This is a female, she's not, Suzette wasn't working out every single day. She wasn't going to the gym, all right? She wasn't doing crunches and all these kinds of things. This is just a regular chimp that was not very well taken care of. You can tell, you can see, she has all these issues with her, with her arms, they had shaved her arms. Not a very happy chimp. Now, he tried a different experiment. This one's even a little bit more impressive. This one with Boma, Boma is a male chimp about 165 pounds, and he wanted to compare it to some South Dakota farm boys. Those were his uh, controls. Uh, as it turns out, Boma was not quite as disgruntled as Suzette and did not grab it, but he sort of went in and sort of desultory, kind of grabs this machine and just kind of went like this a few times and then gave up. Each time he pulled it, it was about 900 pounds. Whereas the South Dakota farm boy, which you could imagine actually tried was about three, four hundred at most, right? So there have been some actually recent papers that I've talked about trying to measure the strength and whether this is really a true kind of measurement of how strong a chimpanzee is. And there are some reasons to believe that these measures aren't perfect. In many ways, they're not very good measures. But by all, uh, in, by all uh, evidence, it seems that chimps definitely are stronger than us and significantly stronger. 
Now, if you think about Newton's, uh, Newton's laws, for example, force equals mass times acceleration, you would expect then that something that could produce so much force could then also create quite a bit of acceleration. And this is the kind of, uh, uh, kind of logic, too, that you know, people on the internet use. So if you go and you check what people on the internet think about the strength of chimps, and you find, for example, uh, Odeo believes that if the average major league shrunken testicle steroid freak can throw 110 miles an hour, then maybe a monkey can do 200. Or maybe, maybe not a monkey, but says Sir Lucius, but maybe a properly trained gorilla. Uh, no change-ups, though, because, of course, precision grip, right? Uh, so he's got some evolutionary thought there. And uh, Celtic Mojo believes, well, if they're seven times stronger, then it should at least be 700 miles an hour, right? Shouldn't it be? So what's going on here? What's, what's wrong with this picture? Even Hollywood got, has gotten into this picture, right? So here's uh, Joey from uh, Friends. This is his first movie. Uh, clearly, he didn't think the Joey thing was going to really work out, and so this is his first movie. Um, I'm, as far as I know, it's his only movie. Uh, and he got paired up with an animatronic chimp. And this is the whole plot point, right? Is that this chimp, well, it becomes his best friend. I'm not going to go into the details of this movie, but <laughs> the point is that this chimp was an amazing third baseman and could really it, it could do much better than Grobus uh, in terms of, his, in terms of his, the length of his throw. All right, so this is a question then. But we know this is not true. We know that Santino is not as good as a little league pitcher. And so this really tells us a lot about a couple of things. It tells us something about the fact that the biomechanics, the way in which bodies turn forces into um, movements, are not as simple as you might expect. And also says something about the derived features of the human body, things that make us different from the chimpanzee, who are our closest living relatives, um, that actually facilitate these kinds of changes. All right. So, to really get at this question, then, we really need to start thinking about, first of all, sort of a basic one. What makes a pitch both fast and accurate? Um, and to help us with this is our, I thought I'd show a video of our, someone we all miss dearly, uh, Madison Bumgarner. Hopefully he'll come back and says he'll be back on Saturday. All right, so here's uh, Madison Bumgarner showing us some really nice technique. So a pitch has a number of different phases to it. There's a stride, which Madison Bumgarner is showing you right now, an external rotation of the body and the upper torso, and then an internal rotation that leads up through the torso, through the arm and the elbow, and then through the wrist and into the hand until you have a finishing throw. And we can break this up into a number of different sequences then. Here I've shown you, we have the end of the stride, we have a max external rotation, then we have this final release. And the green is showing you, uh, the green and pink are really showing you uh, sort of opposing forces. So throughout this whole process, the first, um, first step really then is a turning, when you're turned towards the thing that you're, or you have your shoulder turned towards what you're gonna throw to, right? And then you're already externally rotated, and then there's a step, and then your body, your arm goes back into a cocking phase, right? Um, in which the shoulder is externally rotated, the shoulder is extended, uh, the elbow is flexed, and then as you go into the pitch, you're rotating the whole body around through the shoulder, then out through the arm and through the hand. Um, this is really a complex set of motions, then. It's not as simple as a single joint, for example. In fact, it involves multiple joints. And that's what's so fascinating about it, then, is really it's a story about the whole human body and how it comes together to produce these kinds of rotational forces, these torques at different joints, to actually produce these ultimate uh, throwing forces that we can use on all sorts of objects. And now it doesn't have to be a baseball. I know we're all baseball fans here, but you know, we do have the 49ers somewhere down there in Santa Clara, right? Um, so the same kinds of motions then that we would use to throw a baseball, the same kinds of motions, the same technique really, that we would use to throw a football. It's gonna be a little bit different because the mass of the object is different that's gonna affect your mechanics. But even something that seems a little bit more different, right, an underhanded toss or a submarine throw or a side throw, something that you do in softball, involves many of the same kinds of mechanisms, where the body is rotated, the arm is cocked back, and then it's all released through the shoulder. And then it's not even just ball games, right? You can think of almost 
I wouldn't say every sport, but there's so many sports that involve some aspect of this motion. It really is a fundamental motion of throwing. And it's not just throwing, it's hitting things, right? So you could be hitting something, hitting a, hitting a, a shuttlecock, or throwing a frisbee, or hitting a volleyball, or handball. All of these things involve the same kinds of motions, the same kinds of technique that you would learn in one sport, you really wind up using in another. So it's not only fundamental to throwing, um, or to us, but it's fundamental to lots of different sports. And so that's kind of cool as well. And so really then, this is a story about more than just technique. So there are some important techniques or aspects of throwing which are important. But what we'll see is that even if we could somehow train Santino to be throw-like, a human, he probably wouldn't be able to get the same kinds of uh, speeds out of it because there's something more to it and there's these derived factors of his body. And so this is where I want to go to next is just thinking about what's really changed in our bodies, when did it change, and that helps us to understand why those things changed, why those things, um, how, how they fit back into this larger picture of throwing. All right, so we can divide things into traits we share with apes, and then we also want to know about things that are unique to us. So the traits we share with apes, primitive traits, primitive, and traits that are unique to us are ones that are called derived traits. Um, if anyone, anyone recognize who this is here? Anyone? That's a, like another trivia question for you. I know it's a, you get, anyone likes TMC? Or is it TCM? I can't remember. Turner Classic Movies? I love Turner Classic Movies, even though I can't remember their movie. That's Johnny Weissmuller. He's uh, the original Tarzan. This is Tarzan goes to Manhattan. Uh, and so that's, uh, and that's Cheetah. But anytime you're on a bus, if you think about as you're riding along on a bus, people grabbing handholds, the reason that we can do that is because we are apes, ultimately, right? And we, um, we fit into, if we're doing things in an evolutionary framework, the first thing we need to know is how things are related to one another. So this is our extended genealogy of being human. So here we have humans, right? Let's branch, and we're nested within this larger radiation of apes. Um, we don't have a great fossil record around seven million years ago, but from genetic studies, we know that humans and chimpanzees split from one another around seven million years ago, and because a lot of these apes are more similar to each other than, they are, than we are to any of them, we know that this last common ancestor most likely looked like an African ape. So this is really kind of useful because then we can think about the kinds of traits that all these apes share and think of that as our starting point for evolutionary story, for building a body that can actually throw something. So apes, the traits that they all share all revolve around things that are um, associated with climbing and being suspensory. So, um, you know, I love to tell my, I, you know, I love my kids for lots of different reasons, but I love them especially because of they have really they've really soaked in the fact that apes do not have tails, and apes are big and are under branches. And so anytime they see something like Curious George or whatever, some monkey that has a, or ape, a purported ape that has a, a tail, they're always like, no, that's not, that's, that's a monkey, that cannot be an ape. And so I'm very happy that, so apes are large-bodied animals, they typically are suspensory, underneath branches, um, they're rarely on top of branches, and they're very good at climbing and sort of uh, this, this particular uh, adaptations to being in these kinds of environments. So they have certain features that really distinguish them from us. Now, the traits that I'm going to be focused on here that make us different are ones that are associated, and we're going to start from the bottom, we're going to work our way up, right, just in the same way that we worked our way up from the bottom through the hand uh, when we watched Madison Bumgarner give a, a pitch. Um, that we're going to go from looking at things like long legs and our narrow waist and wide shoulders up through humeral torsion um, uh, as well as uh, um, very aspects of the elbow and finally to our precision grip. Okay? So these are all things that we're going to focus on. All right, so the first thing I really want to talk about then are legs, hips, and torsos. I know a lot of this was supposed to be about shoulder, but I feel obliged to tell you all sorts, about, all sorts of things about the human body. So here we have a chimp and a human. Uh, if we look in Australopithecine, right, our sort of standard issue Australopithecine, and we sort of blow it up and look at it a little bit more closely, the things that really strike you at first is that the upper body in many ways looks a lot like a chimpanzee, and the lower body is really quite derived towards the modern human condition. And the things that really are different include its pelvis, for example, 
as well as, as well as the fact that it has longer legs. The pelvis is really interesting because it has this sort of bowl-shaped uh, aspect to it. There's a rearrangement of all the muscles, all the gluteal muscles and all the accessory muscles that go into walking um, that's different than what you see in a chimpanzee and are more similar to what you see in modern humans. And this is kind of important because it's important to remember that humans are not the only bipeds. In fact, most African apes and most apes in general, even monkeys, even uh, if you watch enough YouTube, even dogs and cats will be bipedal sometimes. The fact is that they're not very good at it. Even this guy, this, chim this gorilla right here, um, uh, I think this is Abraham. Abraham loves the walk around, right? But there's some disadvantages to him being a particularly good biped. And one of those is that he has a really small posterior, right? <laughs> And you notice that he has this really big gut and it sort of sticks out in front of him. And he's standing nice and straight, but when it comes to walking, it makes it a little bit more difficult. Now, humans instead have gin ginormous asses, all right? Um, we have really big butts and they stick out a lot. And there's a reason for that. Um, there's a reason for that because it's really important for stabilizing you during walking. And we also have really uh, powerful hamstrings that have been rearranged. So you can see the hamstrings, hopefully you can see my cursor moving along here. Um, this is a little bit uh, risque here. Uh, I hate to do this, but uh, here, you know, the hamstrings are really quite different in a human compared to this uh, gorilla. And what's important um, is that it affects their walking. Sorry, I lost my place there in terms of a slide. So. The second thing that's really different in terms of Australopithecines compared to uh, um, chimpanzees that's really different is that their back, their lower back in particular, has become longer. So one of the things that makes uh, suspensory apes um, very good at being suspensory is that they have a very short and stiff back. So if they're swinging through the trees or swinging below branches, the, the amount of torque that's going on in their lower body is actually quite low, right? So they have long arms and short bodies, and that makes it easier for the brachiate. Now, humans have five lumbar vertebra. Chimps have about three or four on average. Australopithecines have six. And so we see this real expansion where we have full skeletons. We see this expansion of the lumbar, of the lower back, that's associated with a decoupling in many ways of the upper thorax with the pelvis. Why is this important? Well, if you think about how we walk, our walking is really super efficient. Even the most out of shape of us can probably walk five or six miles and not, um, you'd be tired the next day, but you could certainly do it, right? And we can do it because we have this enormously efficient way of moving around that uh, you can see uh, looking at, you know, uh, uh, that, that's much different than what you would see in, say, a chimpanzee. And for a chimpanzee, and here again is Santino, what you notice is that Santino has to walk with his legs bent because he has this flat pelvis, and this flat pelvis means that he has no mechanical advantage to his hamstrings. He has really no mechanical advantage to his gluteal muscles, and so when he stands up straight, he basically is walking on a teetering sort of um, precipice of almost falling over, and that's why the sort of caricature of a chimpanzee walking, bent-legged and turning side to side. I really don't want to see this on YouTube later, okay, but um, <laughs> that's how they walk. It's not a caricature, and that's, they have to do it because it's more stable that way. Their muscles are just rearranged in a way um, that makes it very impossible, or close to impossible, for them to walk in the way that we would, very efficiently, with a straight leg. It's also um, important thinking about the throwing mechanics, right? Because when Madison Bumgarner is taking that first step, that stride into his pitch, he's also rotating his upper body, and that requires this decoupling of the upper and lower body from one another. And here you can see uh, someone we also really miss, who's no longer with us. Well, I mean, he's still around, but he's not on our team, right? So Timmy Linscombe, right? Look at the amazing amount of external shoulder rotation he has, right? His body, I, don't, I can't even, I'm not gonna try. I'm gonna fall down back here, it's gonna be really embarrassing. Um, he can really torque his whole upper body in a way that's really quite impressive, and certainly is not something you could ever hope to have a chimpanzee do. And this is really has to do with the fact that he can take this stride because he's bipedal, but also because he has this uh, decoupling, like you do, that allows you to rotate your upper body uh, independent of your lower body. All right, so now we've had enough of this part down here. Let's move up and think about shoulders. 
Now, the thing about shoulders is that humans, if we stripped off all the flesh and looked at uh, shoulder and compared between a chimpanzee and a human, what you would find is that uh, there are many things that are the same, but some uh, clear differences in terms of the shape of the thorax. And then this bone right here, which is called the scapula, it's your shoulder blade. You can feel it if you find this little bump on your shoulder. You can actually follow a, a hard bony ridge across. That bony ridge is this line right here. It's this, what's called the scapular spine and sort of demarcates different um, muscles that are associated with your rotator cuff, the supraspinatus and infraspinatus, for example. Okay? So humans clearly have a different design from all of apes, as it turns out, and what's important about the differences is that all these apes have these really what are called cranialized shoulders. Their shoulders are already up. They're already ready to do things up here, which makes sense if you're suspensory, whereas modern humans have a more lateralized shoulder, the glenoids facing in a different direction. Now, the problem with the scapula, if you want to know something about the evolution of the shoulder, is that we don't have a lot of information about shoulders don't really preserve that well in the fossil record. So what we can do then is we can think about uh, the comparative space in which shoulders live, different ways of they can be shaped, and we can actually quantify these things. And here I built something called a morphospace. And you have different animals. So the, here's gorillas and humans are over here in purple. Chimps are in blue. We have gibbons in green and orangutans and other things in orange over here. So there are different ways in which you can construct a shoulder. And well, you notice that there are spaces that are missing. What's fun about this is that, well, fun for me, because this is what I do on a day-to-day on, on -day basis, we can actually do something called in silico paleontology, right? We can actually go back, and then if we have a phylogenetic framework, an evolutionary framework, we can go in and then predict where in this space our ancestors would have lived and what their shoulders would have looked like. So here it is. This is what we predict our last common ancestor's shoulder to look like. And because of this prediction, we can say something about what we predict the actual evolutionary trajectory to be. That we went from a cranialized shoulder to one that's more lateralized in a fairly simple straight line. Now, to test this, we can actually go back to the few examples where we do have um, some shoulders. And one of them, uh, we're fortunate enough to have here in San Francisco. So Zarai Lemsaged, who is now the former curator, he's now in Chicago, the former curator of anthropology here at the California Academy of Sciences, actually found this uh, almost complete skeleton of an infant Australopithecus afarensis around, it's dated to around 3.3 million years ago. It's uh, nicknamed Salam. And what's nice about this is that it's completely encased in sandstone. And so we have these beautiful, beautiful to me, scapula, right? That we can then put back into this space. And yay, science works, right? So the prediction of what this last common ancestor looked like is very close to what we see in Australopithecines. In fact, if we start putting in other fossil scapula, they actually fit really nicely along this particular trajectory. And so we can then go back to our... Uh, um, our static image and have a more sort of dynamic image of what actually has occurred during human evolution. Whereas there's been this progressive lateralization of the shoulder as the thorax has become wider and more barrel shaped. Um, I don't know why I put this slide in here, there's a lot of uh, uh, significance values in here, but the point is, is that this, uh, this change is actually proportional in a very nice linear way to time which is kind of cool. So then if we go back and we think about the evolutionary environment in which Australopithecines and hominins lived, so we have our last common ancestor who lives in a forested environment. We have Australopiths who start moving out into more open environments. And then we have uh, genus Homo who are in uh, completely open environments living with carnivores and things like that. We can imagine a situation in which um, these kinds of changes are both associated with a reduced amount of arboreal behaviors, but also with increased levels of more lateralized behaviors. And what are those lateralized behaviors? What does that lateralization actually mean in terms of throwing? Well, I have two um, really great collaborators who in uh, 2013 actually uh, looked at this question. What they um, posited is that uh, this lateralization of the shoulder is really something that's about lining up this line of action of, pec in particular, the pectoralis muscles, the ones that are going to do this internal rotation of the humerus. Um, they're aligning it with your torso so that when you're doing this external rotation, these muscles here are helping the load and power the rotation of your shoulder. In fact, the rotation of your shoulder 
The rotation of the humerus in particular, your upper arm bone, is the fastest movement your body can make. It's about 9,000 degrees per second. Okay? So it's an incredibly fast, robust movement. Yet the, the conundrum is really that the amount of energy that's produced in a throw is actually less than you put into it in terms of how you're using your muscles. And so it's believed that or their idea is that there's a negative energy that's associated with um, this cocking phase in which you're actually loading the ligaments that cross the rotator cuff and that these ligaments then help power in an elastic way your throw. In other words, your shoulder essentially is a catapult. You're tightening it up as you're doing this external rotation, as you're uh, extending your arm, you're actually loading it up and then as you're uh, bringing it about and rotating it internally, you're actually um, releasing this energy in a passive way that then is allowed, um, then goes through all these different joints and out through the arm. And you can actually um, prove in some ways that this is occurring because you can do, and what they did was uh, an experiment where they put on, uh, obviously not professional baseball players, but um, college baseball players, they put on various devices that restricted the amount of movement that they had of their shoulder. And what this is just to show you, this red line, is that when you do that, you actually inhibit the amount of elastic storage in the shoulder. You actually ex uh, inhibit the amount of storage of energy as well as release of energy. Another thing that's really amazing um, about um, uh, human shoulders is the, I mean, we talked a lot about the scapulas, this upper arm bones, the humerus is um, actually a really useful um, bone to think about because the humerus is one that has diagnostic value to it. Whereas the scapula, and I'll show this in a second, really doesn't change much over your life, something like the humerus actually does. Now, I love this picture because this shows extreme what's called humeral ret retroversion. I don't know if, this is, uh, this is a real picture. <laughs> um, if you want to go back, don't try it here, you're going to hurt yourself, but I'll, I'll do it for you. But if you try to like bring your arm back that far, it's not going to happen. Okay? Um, so some ball players actually have extreme retroversion of the shoulder, and it's actually a juvenile trait. And in many times, uh, pro uh, baseball players or people who play, throw balls or um, even in volleyball players or people that use their arms in these kinds of uh, emotions, they often have a uh, uh, a plasticity in the shoulder um, in which the, the throwing arm actually has this retroversion and the non-throwing arm doesn't. So it seems to be something that's plastic and is changing over a person's lifetime or is at least uh, maintaining a state, a juvenile state, that allows someone to then uh, s uh, pull their arm back. And what's important about this is the lower your torsion, the longer that you can um, uh, uh, move your arm through an arc towards the release point. And the longer you can keep it along that arc, then in theory, the longer, excuse me, the longer you can take some of those passive storage of energy in your shoulder, in the tendons, that catapult, and uh, keep it going through the arm for a longer period of time and actually produce higher levels of force and ultimately speed. Um, there's a, a, a a, a low but significant relationship then between humeral torsion and actual maxillary ball speed. And what's also kind of cool about with this, because it is diagnostic, um, when we look at troglodytes, so chimpanzees, compare them to, say, non-throwing arms, it's about the same in chimps and humans, but in the non-throwing arm, or excuse me, in the throwing arm, uh, human retroversion is actually quite lower. In Homo erectus and Australopithecus, it's also, there's a lot lower torsion as well. Suggestive that um, these factors are playing in them as well. Now, it doesn't have to be the only selection pressure. Um, there are other things that could possibly play into it as well. One of these is digging, and this is something that we're uh, really interested in right now, because if you think about it, this is an energetically expensive activity, um, and this might be something that's also driving selection of the shoulder. You can tell I love shoulders. I keep on talking about it. Sh your shoulder is unique. This is a paper from 1878 looking at all the varieties of shoulders, and they're unique from the beginning. This is your shoulder, not your shoulder, uh, but this is a shoulder at eight weeks of development. Um, and just to give you an idea of how big, this shoulder, first of all, it's not bone. It's not even cartilage at this point. It's pre-cartilage. It's just a loose assortment of mesenchymal tissue. You don't even need to know what mesenchymal is. It's just really early. Eight weeks of development. That's about, it's about that big and it already looks like your shoulder. It's got all the key factors going into it. So it might be that you can't change your shoulder, whereas some aspects of your uh, humerus 
um, can change. So what we feel like is that this then drives certain benefits and costs because obviously we can do the same things that a chimpanzee can do. There's many of the same things that we do that they do as well, right? They're not mutually exclusive. But there are benefits and costs to them. And one of those is shoulder pain. Ken obviously is going to talk a lot more about this, in particular in elite athletes. But shoulder pain is one of the most common complaints that people have. And what we believe is going on is that there are all sorts of aspects, especially as you're what's called abducting your arm, you're moving it away from your body. There are all sorts of aspects of shear and stress that go along with your shoulder that could vary depending on the kind of shoulder you have. And we've tested that. And when we look at shoulders, that are either more primitive, primitive, that look more like a chimpanzee, they're more cranialized versus the more lateralized that we think of as being standard human, and compare them between people who have had rotator cuff tears and ones who haven't, we find that there's a difference, and that the people with tears tend to have the more primitive condition, which is interesting. We're not sure exactly why that's going on, but when you put that back into the evolutionary context, you can see that this vector of evolution, the selection vector, is associated with people who get tears and ones who don't, which is kind of cool as well. And so we're now working on in silico modeling of that. All right, so that's enough about shoulders. I'm probably way over time, but I'm going to just talk about elbows really quickly. Here's a, a really intense looking ball player, Madison Bumgarner. Um, the thing about your elbow is that there's not much that has really changed in your elbow compared to apes. And one of the cool things about our elbows is the fact we can hold on to things and we can do this, right? We can pronate and supinate our arm all through extension and flexion of our arm, right? This is something we can do because we have all sorts of derived features, or excuse me, primitive features that we share with apes that comes from our suspensory ancestors. This sort of primitive uh, elbow, though, at some level, um, uh, when you throw too much, actually is subjected to lots of different forces, right? And so the forces that you've generated in this catapult of your shoulder then have to go through the snapping motion of your elbow. And that can lead to all sorts of issues, right? So here, they've got a great photo series in the, I think it was the New York Times, of just ball players, some photographer just taking pictures of ball players who have had the Tommy John surgery. And so it's a, it's a most common surgery that you'll see in people that overuse their, shoulder, uh, overuse their elbow. The ulnar collateral ligament is highly prone to tearing. And you can think that this is not really a huge, this is probably not a selection pressure in uh, Australopithecines, but certainly it's a selection pressure in pro, pro athletes who are throwing way too much and more than their elbows were really designed to do. And so finally, let's talk a little bit about wrist and hands. Wrist, again, there's not much different about wrist. They're highly extendable, they're highly flexible. Um, what's fun about wrists is that they are really the last point in which uh, you're really uh, adding power into, uh, uh, into your throw. And it's really the last place in which, or one of the first places that uh, uh, modern humans really have seemed to, to uh, uh, um, uh, find ways of uh, building technology that actually enhance the throw. Right? So if you think about something, here's some uh, standard issue uh, at lateral enthusiast, right? So these guys, I don't know, I mean, maybe, I mean, I, I can't throw a ball very fast at all either, but I mean, these guys with an at lateral can go from, say, throwing something about 50 to 70 miles an hour and easily put 90 miles per hour on a spear, a really long spear, and that's enough to take down an animal. It's a pretty ex powerful thing just by extending the length of essentially the wrist, right? They're extending this lever going from, in this case, from 0.68 meters to adding, say, an extra half of a meter to their throw. And this is really a way of getting extra power. And you think about sports in which we do this, it adds all sorts of power, right? So tennis. So we've gone from maximal speed without an accessory, 100 miles an hour, right? Pitching a ball. You add in a racket, sure, it's got a lot of te technology, but even some of the fastest recorded tennis serves, even before uh, highly, um, uh, some crazy rackets, is 150 miles an hour. Quite impressive, right? And then we can also have things like high ally, for example, right? 109, 190 miles an hour, right? And then you think about the ubiquitous dog throwers, right? So essentially, I don't know how fast those suckers go, but I don't want to be nailed by one. But it's the same concept, right? That you extend the length of the wrist, you extend the length of your ability to throw. And that's really the only way that you can get extra speed uh, outside of just pure strength. Okay? So technology, in many ways, outplays the muscles. The final thing, 
trust you. Final thing, uh, thinking about thumbs and fingers, um, the big difference between a chimpanzee and a human really is uh, the ratio of the length of the fingers, especially the palm, but also the fingers, and then the size of the thumb. And really, what's gone with, on in modern human evolution, right, is the thumb has become really long and the fingers shorter, and that gives us this ability to do these really precise grips, right? And we see the evidence of this in Australopithecines already, where we have long thumbs and relatively short fingers. They have some curve to them, which is interesting, suggesting that they're still uh, arboreal, but they have many of the features that suggest that they're doing things that require more manual dexterity. They're more human-like. And it's really this last segment, then, that really powers the final aspect. This is your last time to touch that ball. This is the last time to give it some little extra oomph. And that's really where the precision comes in, right? The difference between a sinker, a slider, a curver, uh, or excuse me, a curve ball, in many ways, um, has a lot, of, lot to do with those final touches that you give to it, the final spin. All right, so just to wrap up, um, I'd like to just say, uh, sorry Santino, um, really didn't have a chance at beating uh, little Jimmy. Um, that there are really uh, some structural differences that really make it impossible for a chimpanzee to throw with some of the, the, the force that we do. But I think what's really fun about this story is that it's more than just one sort of uh, action. It's really something that says a lot about the, the overall changes in the human body that have gone along with our evolution that have in many ways occurred in a mosaic fashion, right? Bipedalism comes before, in many ways, the changes that we see in the overall structure of the arm and shoulder that really give way to things like Madison Bumgarner throwing an amazing fastball. Um, and so this combination then of derived and primitive features really is uh, sort of an important aspect of the evolutionary story, right? That we all are built off of historical constraints and that this history is important for understanding who we are as a people, but also understanding our bodies and how they work. Um, so with that, I will leave you um, with Madison Bumgarner uh, 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 going again, and uh, I'm happy to take, I guess I won't be taking any questions, but I'm happy to release you um, and allow you to get a cocktail, which I too will partake of right now because I'm quite parched, but I thank you very much. <laughs>